so people are still filtering in, but I think we should start. Um, so our next speaker is Travis Griggs, who is even more newbie than uh, the speaker before. He's only been doing small for 20 years, I think, uh, about. Um, and he's um, from Syncom, and he will talk about um, fun stuff. Um, so text rendering is fun, right? Good. So let's start. Thanks, Bert. Uh, you hear me okay? Good. Uh, I have a tendency to talk fast, uh, and I get talking quick, so if I start talking too fast, just wave your hands at me. I don't me mind being told to slow down or to shut up or just to get off stage. Don't throw tomatoes, please. Uh, I haven't been doing this quite as long as Martin. I think Martin's got me beat by a couple years. Um, yeah, so I'm Travis. Uh, somebody put their age on here the other day. I thought I'd put something close. I'm not yet 40. Um, I work at Syncom. I enjoy working there, and uh, we try to make the GUI and the tools better. And I've been doing this since ObjectWorks 4.0. We were the HPUX beta testers back in 1993, 90, late 92, actually. Uh, so I've been working this product. When I'm not doing that, though, I really enjoy hanging out with my family. And we were climbing Mount Rainier this year, and so I thought I'd throw a picture of the things I even go above and beyond that. Um, what's this about? This is not a tutorial. Um, I'm not in a position to give you a tutorial about Pango. It's an experience report. And though experience and expert start with the same letters and have the same root, I'm definitely no expert in this. The more I studied this, the more I learned that uh, I think there's about 20 experts on the planet who really understand font rendering well, at least modern font rendering, and uh, I'm not one of them. I did spend a bunch of time with uh, wonderful texts. Boy, look at the size of these things. I mean, if you drop them, yeah. Well, that's a satisfying sound, isn't it? Look at that. That's been good fun. They really are good. Uh, one's a CGK book that talks all about uh, Asian text rendering, and the, that's, the, that's quite an eye-opener. So um, <laughs> what's that? <laughs> um, so what's Pango? Um, Pango is officially shown with this symbol up there. The first three characters are the Greek characters for P-A-N. Pan, which means all, and the last one is the Japanese Go character, which stands for language. So it was meant as the all language solution. Uh, it was begun, uh, here, here's kind of the declaration statement uh, about Pango. Pango is a library for laying out and rendering of text with an emphasis on internationalization. Uh, they like you to combine it with Cairo. Owen Taylor was the guy who first wrote it, working at Red Hat and Intel. Uh, he did stints at both. It was his job to figure out how to make Unicode work well with GTK, and then it kind of spread out from GTK world. Um, after that, after Owen did all the Unicode part of it and made that work, a guy named Bedad Esfavad, who lives in Toronto and is, an Iran is of Iranian descent, but is rich on his uh, old Persian ancestry, was frustrated with the Linux font rendering, and he went nuts with it. And he's, uh, him and Owen are probably the primary architects, and I owe a lot of thanks to them. They have been very helpful as I've gone to them with questions and answered things, and uh, they've, yeah, they've opened my eyes a bit. They're, they're smart guys. Um, so we need a baseline, and there's a bit of a pun there. Fonts have baselines, uh, but our baseline's a bit different. Um, we need to get a look at where we're at today, or what we're most of us are used to, I think. Uh, and, and, while my, and while this is visual work specific, I spent some time playing Pharaoh for about the last week, peeking at it every time I go look at this. I find that the stuff there is most of the same, uh, and I find that it's most of the same throughout all the small talks, because all the small talks have their heritage in a Western world. And so, you know, most of these have these same limitations, the same baseline. We live in a world where we can map characters to glyphs one to one. You take a, you, you have the letter A, and you get the letter A. Now, some of the some of the European languages add a little, uh, you know, a little accent mark or something above it. But uh, was that a was that a hand motion there? Okay, I'll slow down. I'll get off. <laughs> and we go left to right. Uh, and so, if we look inside Smalltalk, the the core object. Uh, InvisualWorks is called Compose Text. It owns its heritage to the Blue Book Paragraph object, and I think it's gone back to that in Squeak and Faro. Is it, is it called Paragraph there again, I believe? Uh, this gives you some indenting, some tabs, word wrapping, alignment, justification, and some font resolution You know, for a couple simple things. And so that's what most of us have to work with, and for many things, that's all we need. But as we go outside of that, we begin to run into some challenges. Uh, I didn't want to do that yet. It'll be tricky as I, as I go back and forth to make sure I hit the right one. 
first one is glyph resolution. We, uh, we live in a world where we're starting to use glyphs from all sorts of Eastern European and, and Middle East and Asian uh, languages. And we'd like when we display a string in a small talk environment or in an application we make to show up all the characters. Uh, regardless of the base font. And uh, so the first thing that we hope to get from Pango is will it, will it be able to show all the different characters we show? And uh, once you do that, you kind of have a, what's the first Pango app I write? And uh, you go to the community app and they say, you need to write a character map viewer. And so you do that. So I'll quickly show you how I did that here. Uh, this is right here, this piece of code here. Can you see that okay? It's a bit small. Scoot forward. <laughs> I'm not going to spend that. We, we would spend time trying to get that lar large right now. So this first, this highlighted chunk of text is kind of a, it's a Fibonacci series, but it's a Fibonacci series of characters. I start with the root A and A, and then add A to A, and then keep going the last two and building up a string. So if we inspect that, um, we'll get this set of characters. And VisualWorks doesn't do such a good job. It'll get some of the ones. It'll get the A and the A and the what we call the angel A, the A with the, the, the not, and the N with the this, and the I, and after that, these characters just kind of break down. So then we're curious, you know, could Pango do that? So if we take a Pango layout object, give it the text of fib string, and this is the small talk interface to it, inspect that, we would expect to get all those characters in there. Some of these, so some of these fonts don't actually modify those code points. So it's kind of nice, because we get all the way up to, I think, about one, well, we get well into the, I forget what the top one was. Um, so it's nice. We'll be able to resolve all the characters with it, regardless of the font. It'll go find the right character, uh, regardless of your language, and, and get it in there. So then th you have this rite of passage here that I put together. Uh, this was my character viewer, and it allowed me to show that Pango, you know, when you don't have a character, prints the hex box for it, and, and we can scroll through it. And uh, today it doesn't die a horrible death for us. Boris was watching me do this yesterday, and I'd scroll about five pages, and I would just pour it up. Uh, so I was working out some issues there. So yeah, you have your, you can look at all the code points in the system. We could scroll all day here. There's millions and millions of them. One of the things you do when you're playing with this is you go to your package manager and you load every font you can from Debian. And it takes about an hour to download all them. And then you have about, you know, 12,000 fonts and uh, you can just go nuts with them. So dropping back over here. So that's challenge one is can we get all the characters shown? And I know that uh, most of small talk struggle to do that. You go beyond Latin one, extended Latin, and they just kind of break down unless you start doing extra things to the environments. Um, it's not necessarily enough to do just that, though. Anybody read that? Yeah, it was meant to look bad. So if you read it backward, uh, it says Arabic, Persian, Hebrew, to name a few, and a picture is worth a thousand words. If you don't do right to left rendering, which is what this is, this is about how their text looks to them. It'll go on the right side, but all their characters will be backwards, but going the wrong direction. So there's a good chunk of people out there who speak Arabic and Hebrew and Persian and a couple other languages like that. And if we don't get this right, this is the experience they have. Even if we can go get their characters, it'll all look backwards. So again, we go to an example here. The picture is a thousand words. The next app you write in Pango is 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 a care is a is a layout visualizer, and uh, there's a bunch of set scripts, and here's some Arabic text here, and uh, yeah, I'll just jump up in font a little bit. So this allows me to, this allows me, uh, I dig into the actual layout object and render some of the information about it, but the point is, is here we have Arabic char characters, and they're flowing from the right to the left the way you'd expect them. I didn't have to do anything other than call the library. I think we could do Hebrew just as well. So there's some Hebrew text. And so this is all done right to left. And I think it, it, the library does all that for you. Just feed it characters and away it goes. So I wish it would keep Keynote up for me when I made that change. So if that's not enough of a challenge, getting those right, then you get into this thing called BIDI, or bidirectional text support. Uh, this becomes interesting if you're going to mix text. In a, in, in a, you see this in... in uh, some uh, web pages might have mixed text, an Arabic label and, uh, you know, and some other things. And so we, we want that to look right, too. So we'll, what does Hello World have to do with my presentation? Well, I'll show you, and we'll do a more timely example. I've got this one here for now, challenge three. Uh, I'm going to open it right back up. So we want this hello one right here. So this is hello in a whole bunch of different languages. Uh, it gives their label here. 
and it gives this. And if you look closely, I didn't make this quite dark enough. I, like I say, I'm annotating the various aspects of the text rendering engine. But there's a gray triangle behind some of these texts. This one right here has a gray triangle behind it. And that means every time we see that, it did a text reversal on me. So it'll be rendering left to right, and then it'll turn around and go right to left for a while. And then it can turn around and go left to right again. So Arabic, the, the, the hello world in Arabic, or hello is that way. And I think Hebrew is reversed. And Yiddish. And there were some other ones I thought. But uh, there's, some, uh, there's some ancient scripts. As people begin to render ancient scripts, this gets, they start going all different directions. And um, so you say, yeah, that's great. You know, I'm not writing an application that needs to mix text. Well, one that's kind of interesting is, is Arabic text. Uh, Arabic text reads right to left with one exception. Uh, the exception is that the number system that we borrowed from them, they still do that left to right. And so if I go back to this thing over here, here's a little chunk of code here. Um, what it does is it generates dates going backwards by 100 days and prints them with various timestamp formats uh, in Arabic. And so I'm going to run this chunk of code grabs today and just works back with 100 days and use the, the, the VisualWorks uh, locale stuff to print it. And that made a file called ArabicDates.txt. And so we'll go back to our little visualizer here. And it's up a directory. And so here we have all the Arabic dates. And this is where it gets interesting because you see the numbers read left to right like you and I would read them. But the months and the days, they read right to left. And you ha if you want to render Arabic in any app you write, if you're doing anything with time, you're going to need to get this video algorithm right. So this is yet another challenge facing as we move into modern text and, and, and international text rendering that we just can't do above our baseline. And Tango just kind of magically handles it all for us. Yes, sir. Little, just a little comment about uh, numbers in Arabic. Mm -hmm. uh, it happens that I, uh, I'm, uh, um, Arabic is my mother tongue. And uh, uh, just historical note, historically Arab in Arabic, we read numbers starting with, with the units, then the, the tens and the, s the... Right. And in modern Arabic, they turn it around. Okay. Interesting. But That's been one of the neatest things about this for me, is to break out of my Western world culture and discover. And you have these initial questions like, how did they get this far doing this way? And as you go a little farther, you gain insights into how that works. And that's, that's been enlightening for me. I've enjoyed that. So uh, move to a new challenge. We'll call this challenge shaping uh, the story of A and A, the diacritical twins. So uh, this one's, again, best explained if we go look at some code. When, uh, when Unicode went through and, and, and started adding all these characters, like the A with the, or that, or that was even before Unicode, they had an interesting problem because A comes in at, at code point 64, I think, but then they added the A with the little circle above it at C5. And if you sort those, um, it creates an interesting problem. So I'm going to make a string with three characters here, B, the A with the, the circle over it, and that. And uh, I'm going to do the classic sorting algorithm, the C sorting algorithm, and we'll sort these. And uh, what we'll see here is we get A, B, A. And this isn't usually what we want from a sorting perspective. Uh, we want the A down between the A and the B. And so the new uh, Unicode sorting stuff in VisualWorks, if I put it in that mode and I do that, it'll get this right. So what does this have to do with text uh, and, 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 and shaping? Well, what's really happening, the way, the way the sorting is working, is Unicode is taking that, and when it's sorting, uh, we d what we do is called denormalization, where we take the A with a zero apart it and break it into a string of characters. And it's really this character, this string right here, an A followed by the code point just for the circle. We call that the uh, diacritical, that diacritical combiner, which puts the circle above an arbitrary letter. And so what we do is we basically have to go and break all those down and then turn around and sort it. So sorting with Unicode can be quite involved because you're constantly having to rip characters apart to turn them into decomposed strings so that then you can use the classical sorting algorithm on them. And uh, the Unicode consortium, I don't think they've had much luck with this, but they would like people to actually store data that way because that means it's already in sortable format. But that creates a problem. We don't want it to look like this. VisualWorks, if we inspect just this string, uh, kind of small there, it can't even print the, 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 the little zero. But it, it, it wants to print them as two, as two elements side by side. 
And what shaping involves basically is recognizing is that two characters occupy the same cell, or three or four, and then combining them appropriately. And so if we do this with Tango, what we want to see, I've got two characters. One is the A and the other is the A with the, one is the A followed by the code point, and then the other is the, the single code point. If we inspect that, that's what we want to see. And so Pango can do shaping. And uh, as we move into Unicode characters, and especially this is a simple shaping example, one of characters we used to. When you use move into uh, the Indic texts and Korean texts and some of the others, this is almost every character is done this way. It's not just one or two ones offs. Almost all their characters are composed in an interesting way. And so unless, unless you have the ability for a shaping engine, per language, uh, you have a real lot of work to do. And there's a lot of work that goes into these. Uh, this is a difficult task to assume yourself, is to go off and write an Indic shaper, because you probably don't know enough about Indic yourself to do it right and to know all the ins and outs. And so this is, again, something that we're glad to get for free from them. Uh, so challenge, yes, sir, Bert. Um, and also, it's not even just a script. It's also depending on the language. Yes. Because the same script is used in different languages, mm -hmm. but the shaping works differently. Exactly. It's so, really like crazy. commas in Japanese should shape differently as well as periods. The punctuation in Japanese is, is shaped differently. And some of the characters I know in, in Tamil will actually they'll change each other as they even get in the proximity of each other. And uh, yeah, it's it's entertaining. It's a bit of work I don't want to do. Uh, so the last one is vertical text. Uh, and this does not mean rotating text. If you have an affine transform graphics engine, you can rotate text. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is the ability to do this right to left and work through characters, but the fact that uh, in Asian print, for example, uh, especially older Asian print, a lot of times you find that they still read their Chinese characters in vertical columns from right to left. And so Pango does that. I know it actually does it all the right, right way because I've seen examples of it. I'm only doing it okay right now. I'm not doing it completely right yet. I need to have a more involved discussion with Badad uh, about how to, how to drive this right. But if we go to back down in here to mix text, test mix. So this is interesting because this has mixed text. We've got Arabic going one direction. We've got English and we've got Japanese. What we really want to see is that if we rotate this 90 degrees, uh, it does the right thing. Now, what's not working right now is that with my, it's only working at one font size, and I need to get with Badad about why that's happening. I, I, I'm not doing something right. So I have to actually make it very small. The 12-point font, the 12 point font works fine. But in that case, what you see uh, is these characters, ro though, the, though the layout rotated, the characters, we call this gravity, the characters have gravity attached to the bottom of them, and for different scripts, the gravity goes in different directions, but it knows that for Japanese gravity, it stays down. For English gravity, it rotates, and it keeps track of all this for me. And uh, that's kind of cool that I just throw a string at it, and if I could get the point size right, I can render the vertical text with mixed English and Arabic in it. Uh, sky's the limit. So I think uh, we've got two more challenges here. We want to do text transformations. Another thing we'd like to do beyond our baseline. Uh, rendering text, rotating it, placing it, laying out, it's all kind of fun. But sometimes you just you want to go even farther beyond that. So one of the nice things about Pango combined with Cairo is you can get it to emit vector versions of all the different little font glyphs. And once we have the vectors, we really can go nuts with that. Uh, so I sat down and wrote, just for, for visualization's sake, I was curious what different fonts look like. So I wrote this little tool. Input a string. I'm going to input eSug. I'm going to crank the font size up to about 300. And so this gives me basically a, an annotated version of what the font designer did for this particular font. Uh, I could go select lots of fonts. I had so many fonts I needed to break them down into submenus, and even some of these menus still scroll off the screen. Um, but this allows me to look at fonts and how the stroke designers went through and designed the S, where they put the curves, where they put the bezier, the straight lines, and things like that. Uh, and this is all part of the true type font specification. But once you have that path, if you can draw it, you can also play with it. So you can do something like this. And I didn't, you could, you could go a lot farther with, th with this than I did. Uh, I didn't solve this corner problem very well. But basically, you can take a character, build a path out of it, and then take the path from the other character set, 
and use the tangents and do an arc parameterization on the big S and then move the characters around it. And if you, if th the interested student will go spend the time to make it jump letters correctly so you don't get this smear when it tries to bend the M around the edge there and things like that. But when small tech met Tango, I was really, really happy and most things worked out okay. And I uh, had a good time doing that. So I think we have one more challenge here. So um, for most people, just rendering is enough. It's like, cool, this, I can do all kinds of fun stuff with these layouts. I can make them and I can throw them at the screen and it draws them right. Uh, but if you need to interact with the text, then it's like a whole new level. Uh, and uh, so the final rite of passage when you go back to them, I was looking for something in between. I thought I'd done the easy ones and I deserved a medium one. And they said, no, you need to write an editor now. And I went, oh boy, that's going to be fun. Uh, so I didn't actually write much of an editor, but I did sit down for a little while and write a little bit of an editor. And so uh, I can type things in it. And uh, this is all rendered with Tango. And the nice thing is, is Tango's doing all the mapping from points back in two and four characters. And uh, I can use it to play with multilingual stuff. Uh, I wrote, uh, I did this in such a way I could embed one editor inside of another editor and subclass it. So I wrote a little Unicode character inputter here. And uh, these sequences you see in the back screen are the sequences for the Korean JAMO, which composed the word Hangul. Yes, sir. Say again. They give you the APIs to go from points to objects. And they're pretty powerful because when you're in multilingual text, you have these issues of the fact that your flow of characters may turn around. But given a point, you can say, hey, what's the code, you know, what's the string index uh, at this given point, and wow. vice versa. And, I'd, and, and they give you the, I'd like the cursor, I'd like to know where the cursor should go, either the strong cursor or the weak cursor to go if I'm going to be after this character. Okay. And so they give you those APIs, and then it's just a matter of, you know, writing the, okay. the interface to do that. Okay, thank you. So if I put in 1112 there and then 1161, so this is another example of shaping here. It actually combines those two characters to be a single one. And if it was behaving quite right, it would combine that third one. And again, that's a question that I need to go ask abroad. It'll be these ones, 1100, 1173. And to combine those two, if you saw it flipped them and put the one under the other, enter. And so there's the the almost correct rendering of Hangul, which is how you see, yeah, is, is the Korean language. Uh, it does the right to left thing as well. If I do the, I will show you 635, enter, see that jumps to the right side, 636, enter. And so this is where it gets interesting. If I start typing the numbers one, two, three, four, you see where the direction reversal comes in and it turns around and goes the other direction. And as soon as I go back to Hebrew text or Arabic text, it'll start going the other way again. So this was fun to write, and I didn't really, minus getting the, the mapping between the two, uh, it was fun to be able to do this. And I didn't spend the time to go and hook up to the Linux, um, whatever they're currently, uh, IBUS is what they're currently using to get multilingual characters in there. Um, so those are the challenges. Those were the kinds of things I looked at as we went from the base. So uh, a little less uh, of those now. So. I a little bit about the binding I've built to date, uh, which is no, which like I say, is not a complete work, but it's uh, it's getting there. Did this similar to the Cairo graphics binding we did? Uh, that worked out well, and Bedad Estabad and Owen are both contributors in the Cairo community, so the libraries have some similarities, and they want them. They're they're considered a pair. Uh, we tried to be as faithful as possible to Tango API names. We want if somebody comes along with Java or not Java C uh, GTK experience in Pango and is reading some small talk code, it was important to us that they be able to recognize the same names. As small talkers, we have a tendency to take somebody's library and reinvent a whole bunch of words for it to build a model of it. And we tried to keep that thin so that the Pango model came through. There were a couple places where we couldn't, but we tried to be as faithful as we could. Pango coordinates are always in 1024 scaled integer integers, so everything is an integer times 1024, so we used these two simple methods just to go to back and forth from it. Uh, we only did the basic high-level APIs. There's a huge set of APIs if you want to write your own text renderer for a new type of scripting language. Um, but uh, we didn't expose any of those because we didn't need them. And we've all, Pango can be pointed at multiple backends. The one it is most happy with is Cairo, and we only worried about that one. We didn't worry about hooking straight up to Windows um, APIs or, or Xcode or OSX APIs or even XFT. Most of those, they, don't, they, they tell you just to use the Cairo stuff. 
so just a quick overview of how we're doing for time. 11.05. What time do you want to start? You want to start at 15? But I started late, so you're starting late. <laughs> you don't want to start at all? Uh, eight minutes left. Okay, so we'll move through these. Uh, Right. So you have this object called layout. It's kind of the, an an uh, the analog to compose text or paragraph. It does the same types of stuff, but it does these types of things as well. Uh, can do single line mode, direction control. You can do ellipsification, put the little dots in if it's too long and control its right, left end. Uh, you can do all kinds of fun stuff with it. Uh, that's the main one you usually use. There's some lower ones, the font description. Um, this is pretty familiar. You can either make them from strings like you saw in those example, Arial 24, but you can also set their family, their style, their weight, their variance, and do fun things with these. Um, layout lines, you can pull the layouts apart and look at a line at a time, do various queries against them. Uh, iterator, they have an iterator object, which is actually kind of, I know it's, it's we don't do iterators in small talk, but it actually is very helpful for this, a, a streaming type, we do streams. I guess you can think of it that way, but it allows you to enumerate a layout by a number of different ways. You can enumerate it by line or character or cluster or run. Uh, if you want to know what those mean, ask me later. And you can get any one of those and get some, you know, where am I at, where's my current baseline, things like that. The Pango context, usually it's just taken care of for you, but you can use it to get all the, all the font families and query some stuff and set your DPI and set your default font. Tabs, I'm just kind of moving through these. One of the things we did in Pango, we did this the same way we did it in Cairo, is uh, being a C library, you have lots of constants, and they're usually in enums. Uh, you know, you have a style enum, or a, a, and, a, and uh, for italic, bold, oblique. So the way we did that in, in Cairo, and we, we liked it, so we continued, is we basically to make a class out of every one of those, and then we use class side methods. So it reads just like this, the ellipsize mode right, it's the end, and, and that it'll return an integer code the same way. We could make shared variables out of them, I guess, but uh, geez, there'd be a lot. And uh, then you lose some kind of some con context about what they are. Um, so attribute lists. This is how you get like colored fonts and stuff. This is similar to the emphasis you place on text in Smalltalk. Uh, the, the, the run array, I think, is, the, is what you do. You have a text in Smalltalk, and you take a run array, and you can say, I want it bold from this character to that character, italic from here to here. So uh, you have attributes in Pango, and we have an attribute object, which is like that. We don't use symbols. Uh, and you can do all these different kinds of things. The italic ones are ones that Smalltalk generally support, things like foreground color. And all the non-italic ones are the ones they don't, and that I got from Pango for free. And so I was kind of torn, because these aren't extensible. You get what Pango offers here. You don't get to add a new symbol and come up with a new way of rendering, of mapping that type. On the other hand, uh, gosh, I got quite a few of them. So I, was, I think I like this way better. I like getting a free bag of stuff, even though, because we haven't bothered to extend it this far over all these years, I don't think we're going to. Uh, one of the more interesting one is the shape attribute, which allows you to actually replace a, gi a, a given glyph with whatever you want to draw. It'd be a callback. And this was interesting because it was a C callback. And uh, what we did is this kind of middle bullet here, where we basically register blocks in a small talk registry and associate it with the C object. And then when the callback comes back, we go find the block associated with that C structure and call the block. And uh, it works pretty well. Um, I, we don't have time for examples. I've got two examples. One of the nice things is when you insert these graphics, it will automatically do the, the line adjustments. You don't have to worry about the fact that my line size is 34 points or whatever. It, it can do variable line heights. Oops, not that one. Uh, yeah. What it doesn't do um, th that I'm disappointed in is you can't... Uh, you can't annotate a glyph with it. And I've talked to Badat about changing that and being able to say, no, go ahead and render that character, but I'd also like to render a shape next to it. I'd like to put a glow beneath it or you know, put a little glyph in front of it or something like that. So, so we've talked about what the API would look like to do that. He's, he's open to the idea. That's good. Um, one of the things that gets old, though, when you do these text emphasis in Smalltalk after having done it for a long time is that you know, if you have different emphases, it's a pain to say, oh, you know, I, I want part of the text bold and part of this. You end up running saying, well, emphasize from, to, with, bold, or whatever. So Pango has a markup language. It's actually very nice. You can just come along and say, hello, ESUG. And if I were to do that in Pango, I would get part bold and part. So I don't have to do this figuring out what the index or which, which is very handy if you're doing translated stuff. Because if you're going to go fetch that string, you don't know where the resulting indices are going to be to emphasize from. So the only thing it doesn't do is the shapes. But other than that, you can go nuts and do it all with this markup stuff. It's very handy for a lot of stuff. 
um, some issues I had. How are we for time, Bert? Three minutes. Um, we've got to have questions. Uh, memory management, same issue as Cairo. We do it pretty much the same way, but we dis I discovered as I did this that uh, Pango wasn't quite as consistent as uh, Pango as Cairo had been. You had some structures that were ref counted like the Cairo ones, but some weren't, and then others were just different. So this led to some of those core, dump core dumps I talked about earlier, and it was no fun to figure out when it goes wrong, but I think I've got most of those ironed out now. Um, UTF-8 is interesting. UTF-8 is cool because you don't have to worry about Indianness. You don't have to worry about is this little Indian or big Indian or any of that. On the other hand, it's kind of tricky because as small talkers, we're used to saying, you know, I've got a character index four and I want to go to index five. And when you go to UTF-8, that doesn't work anymore because the next one may be three bytes instead of two bytes or one byte. And so I found that I went back to kind of thinking about things like I used to in C with pointers and just moving the pointers forward and backwards. And then it wasn't so bad. But that was a bit of a brain warp for me to go through as I tried to adjust there. Uh, different platforms. Pango works great on Linux. I did all the examples there. It works pretty good on Windows. It uses the Unistribe. It, it basically uses the Windows API to do a lot of its work. It just has its interface there. It's a real pain to build there, though. Um, Bert knows that from some. Uh, the, OS OX one, uh, the OSX one builds okay, but the OSX one is currently built on Atsui, which is Apple's old font layout technology and doesn't yet do core text. So it means that it uh, doesn't work so well once you get into some of these higher code point ranges. And when you get into older Unix X11 installs, older Solaris, AIX, it gets interesting real fast. Sometimes somebody's built it, sometimes somebody hasn't. Oops, wrong button again. Uh, let me jump that one. Converting VisualWorks. So yeah, this last one is people will ask, why not just take this and, and use VisualWorks to do this? In just make the core VisualWorks APIs do this and you instantly get pretty font rendering at least on on, uh, on Linux and you can kind of do that uh, so this is the final demo we do here hopefully I started late so I get extra time right but not much because this is the we're, we're running to the end here uh, this is We'll take and do this and load this. The, I don't know if you can see, but the fonts here uh, are kind of pixelated because they're using the old stuff, and suddenly we get smooth fonts everywhere, and everything is being now rendered with Pango in this image. The problem you get into, uh, I see it, wow, cool, uh, is, is you get into this problem of the fact that not all, as, as soon as you move to modern fonts, they're not pixel aligned. They're, they're not pixel length, and so if you go down here and uh, enter some text, you'll find that it doesn't like to uh, start to see it moves them around because it's trying to align them to integer coordinates. And so it's one of those things that's like, gee, we got 90% there instantly almost. Uh, not many methods. It replaces a couple methods, but then it gets real tricky after that. And VisualWorks architecture makes that a bit harder. So my timer's gone off. Uh, gee, that's like last night. I feel good. I was just like all the guys last night. And we'll go to questions. No, we, no, we have a five minutes for questions. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. There's one more challenge you for forgot maybe, or I don't know if it's covered by. I ran out of time to cover it. Yeah. Nah, yeah. come on. It's uh, glyphs which are not addressed by Unicode. For example, tabular um, digits. So it's just the one is like the one. In from Unicode, but it uh, has a s fixed uh, space, so you can align it in a, in a table. And Unicode doesn't give you one of those? Nope. I'm nope. amazed. Nope. They, they seem to have well everything the else the in Unicode. A lot, lot of other I think stuff there's a symbol for a coffee machine <laughs> in Unicode. <laughs> 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 well, actually, Unicode does give you stuff like that, but the font designers don't care about that. So right. They, they um, there are many fonts that have uh, table numbers, they're called. Um, so they have two sets of numbers in them, and you can use well, at least two. So there, there are lots of fonts. Professional fonts do have that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm and pretty sure that Tango that. lets you choose between different uh, glyphs for the same character. Yeah. yeah. So you, you need to uh, somehow get at them to, to render them. Uh, I don't know if Tango is covering them, but I have a second question. Okay. Which you skipped over very fast because you have no time, of course. But so Syncom is pondering for a long time how to deal with cross-platform uh, moving ahead with all this graphics. 
how far are we, or is there a roadmap for reaching a decision or something like that? <coughs> um, so that was this slide right here. Um, and the middle part is probably the most important part. Uh, th there's nothing committed to it today. I, recognition is the first step. You know, realizing how complex this gets, in some ways sharing all this makes you realize, geez, this is a lot of stuff. Um, you get it, and, and you basically come to the question of, if you're going to do this in Linux uh, and you want to do it natively, you're going to use Pango. It is the native solution there. And then people build Pango for Windows and OS X as well. Uh, but then some people say, no, just use Unistribe directly, which is fine. Maybe we should just do that. Uh, either way, it in some ways it makes sense to start with Pango because it's open source. So I can go rip apart the code and look at it and learn at it. I can ask people about it. Um, and so that's been very, you know, so, so whether we want to use Pango on Windows or OS X is kind of an unknown question for me still. Uh, why not do it all in Smalltalk? You know, you sometimes get there and you look, geez, I could just take this library and do it all in Smalltalk. That would be pretty cool. The thing that scares the living daylights out of me there is the shaping engines. Uh, the shaping engines are non-trivial. And, uh, and these are basically plugins. It's a, it's a plug-in architecture you have with Pango where you get the core stuff, but then you have these plugins that load as you do different scripts. And uh, I don't want to have to write all those. And I don't want to figure out how to, you know, it's like, so you're going to do the Uniscribe one, or you're going to do this one, and trying to reproduce. And uh, the other thing is, I it's, this, it's, this, it's this classic schism. You know, in Smalltalk, we're all, we, we talk for years about reuse. And, uh, and yet we struggle sometimes to use other people's stuff. And for me, kind of there's a pro to going to, to, to existing in the Pango Cairo community and them knowing I'm doing small talk with it. It validates small talk still. It's not a has-been language as much to them. They're like, oh, wow, people are doing modern, interesting stuff with it. And when I contribute to their project, they are more likely to go back, you know, consider, you know, not just kind of look the other way. Uh, but you have the cons. You're, you know, I mean, you're dependent on a third-party library now and a DLL, and it makes your VM footprint bigger and things like that. So I don't know if that answers your questions. It, it, at least those are the thoughts on my head. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, one more question. And maybe Hernan can already move forward and you can unplug. Yeah, come hang out with me, Hernan. I, I've got it warmed up for you. I've got yes, the official response now. Thank you, Alan. Do you have any gas? And then if you, um, you know, I think we need to understand, you know, in a decision like this, what the customers are doing, have people using it for real. So I think with Pango, that's likely to follow the same, same thing. You know, it looks like a promising technology. It looks like a lot of work we don't want to do. We'd like to make it available for people to use in applications. If that really works out, do we take the step of saying, okay, we are going, we're going to make the whole thing use this, we're going to deprecate and eventually remove the old graphics APIs, but with the level of backward compatibility we have, that's, you're still talking about years. I mean, yes, we have a lot of customers who move very slowly. We have people who, you know, go, now I want to port from 7.2 up to the current version, and they really don't want that to be a massive effort. So, I, I mean, I think to some, some extent moving slowly is a good thing. I understand that there's also impatience, but, but I think by making it available to people to use in their applications, hopefully we can address that. Thanks. Um, I'd like to make a, um, so we need that projector uh, going here. Can someone do something about it, um, please? And I'll have to come in too. Um, so I know of two other uh, solutions uh, that use Pango in, in Smalltalk. Uh, one is uh, Scratch is using a little plugin that's called Unicode plugin. Um, it's implemented on Windows using the Windows native engine and on Mac using the Mac native engine and on Linux using Pango. Uh, 
but it doesn't really do layout. It just renders single words. So it's a very simple API. It just hands the Unicode string to the plugin and it gets back a little bitmap that is the label, basically. And for, um, for Scratch, that's sufficient. Um, and the other thing is that eToys uses a Pango plugin on the old PC machine, which is Linux, so that's easy. And what, what uh, Yoshiki Oshima uh, did there is he's just using, uh, he's just handing the Smalltalk text object, which has some attributes, uh, passing that to the plugin, and the plugin does a delay out, so it has a rectangle which it needs to ri uh, write into, and then back comes the, um, the bitmap, basically, and I think the positions of the characters. Um, so it's a very simple-minded interface, and it doesn't really, it doesn't even do as much as the original Smalltalk uh, layout, but at least it lets us do uh, the interface in, even in left to right, uh, right to left languages. Uh, not perfectly, but uh, I heard um, reports from uh, Arabian script using countries um, that, uh, that the kids do use it, and it's better than having it in English because they don't read in English. So, thanks, uh, Travis. <laughs> and our next speaker <laughs> is going to be Hernan Wilkinson. Uh, I'm probably pronouncing it totally incorrectly. Uh, excuse me for that. Uh, he's from Argentina at the University of Buenos Aires. Um, we're getting even more into newbie land, so he has only 15 years of experience, uh, at least according to his bio. And he's going to talk about a conference um, a conference management system, uh, which is, I think, the one used for ESAC? Yes. yes. So let's give him a hand and please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, I'm going to talk about a controversial talk. I'm going to give a controversial talk. So that's, that's my idea. My 